a little confused. Wait, first let me say, it's nice to be home. It's Amen. so nice to be back home. Um, and some of you know what that means, and others of you know what it's talking about. But it's nice to be back home. Um, some of you may be confused because Oscar read uh, Acts 2, 44 through 47. And Jack put Jeremiah 31, 3 in here. And she did exactly what she was asked to do. <laughs> so there's no typo here. But I'm editing on the fly this morning. I'm actually, you know, going, boom, let's change this, let's change that. Because in here it says, the God misconception. And, actually the title of the sermon is, not sermon, I'm not a preacher. The title of the talk is the success formula. I thought this might be a, a little more appropriate. Let me tell you a little bit about the story. Um, Jeff emailed me and asked me if I could speak on the night. And I had two speaking engagements in uh, Asheboro. And I said, I emailed Jeff back and I said, well, Jeff, you know, I don't know if I can prepare another sermon for Pittsburgh this, this soon after Asheboro. I sent that email and I thought, well, Ron, of course you can. You don't, have to, you don't have to prepare another sermon. All you have to do is just preach the same one you preach in Asheboro here. And so I, went, I emailed him back and said, Jeff, you know what? I'll just do the sermon in, um, in this brother that I've got to in Asheboro. I said, you know, duh. And um, he said, OK. But as I thought during that time, I thought, well, you know, I don't know if this is appropriate for Pittsburgh because this is something I wanted to say to Asheboro. And I would say something slightly different than Pittsburgh, so I started preparing another sermon for Pittsburgh. And then the, I, I invited a, a bunch of people. My wife said, don't use the word bunch. So I started, I started inviting a bunch of people, a lot of people, to this because it was going to be a talk about God. And the misconceptions that so many people have about God. But then I started getting responses from all of those people. And everybody had a legitimate reason why they couldn't be here. I mean, I would not look at any of their emails and say, or their return calls and say, you're lying. You're just trying to figure out a way out of this. It all looked legitimate to me. Coming down to the, to the, to the wire, I thought, well, you know, this is something I want to say to people who are not. I'd be kind of preaching to the choir here, so I want to say this to people who are not a part of this church. So let me put that off. So I reworked that sermon for, for Ashboro for you guys because you're in different places. And we'll just leave that in different places. Um, so here is the success formula. When I was in Amway many years ago, which stood for the American way, I started my presentation uh, by writing on the top of my whiteboard, dream. So imagine a whiteboard that has the word dream written across the top of it. Now, some of you have been to an Amway presentation, and so you know you've experienced this dream session before. And I would begin by asking if you had unlimited financial resources, all the money you wanted, what would your lifestyle look like? And I would get all kinds of answers like big houses, jets, and some of these answers are my answers. Jets, exotic cars, so far this is me. Expensive clothes, Rolexes, diamonds, travel, big bank accounts, fame, exclusive privileges, etc., etc. They would be living the lifestyle of the rich and famous. And some of the younger people may not know what the lifestyle of the rich and famous is, but that was a television show that came on years ago. And it just depicted the lifestyles of the very super rich all over the world. And went into their houses, showed their cars, didn't show their bank account, but you saw just incredible lifestyles. Now, worldly success looks different from kingdom success. Would you guys say that's true or false? And I asked Asher, I thought, man, nah, this question doesn't go over real well with a church congregation, but I asked them, if you could live a success life, what would your successful life be like? And of course, they gave me questions, gave me answers like, oh, I would give money to my church, and you know, it was all church answers. So I want to ask you that question here. But the dictionary defines success this way: the correct or desired result of an attempt, someone or something that is successful, 
person or thing that succeeds, the accomplishments of one's goals, the attainment of wealth, position, honor, respect, or fame. And the obsolete definition of it is just an outcome. Just how things turn out. But we don't use it that way anymore. Now we think of success as the worldly definition of success. Now, now this is a real question. Can someone uh, give me some names of some of the world's successful people? Anybody name any, anybody that you think is an ultra successful, successful person? Okay, he's on my list. Okay, who else? Ford. Who? Ford. Ford? Okay. What, you, you may as in Ford or Ford Motor Company? Okay. Who else? Steve Jobs, yeah, yeah, the former Steve Jobs of Apple, okay. Anybody else? Disney. Disney, okay. Those are good names. Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett, okay. Right. So I had them on my list and I took them off so I don't have any, any, any stats on them. But Bill Gates, anybody have an idea of what his uh, estimated yearly salary is? 50 billion. Oh, come on. No, no, I'm sorry. No, no. His, his, his estimated annual yearly uh, salary is 7.2 billion. So you're a little, you're a little uh, if he was a country, he'd be the 37th wealthiest country in the world. He would be the 37th wealthiest country in the world. Uh, what about his net worth? Anybody got any guesses on his net, net worth? Huh? What? Okay. Okay, his, his net worth is um, estimated at about $72 billion. Carlos is just grimacing figure over here. So, but less than 40 years ago, he was making, less than 40, he was making $115,000 a year. Bill Gates, 15000 He's the chairman of Microsoft, the co-chairman of the, of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the CEO of Cascade Investment, the chairman of Chorus. At age 59, he's one year and eight months older than me. Okay, I'm hovering somewhere around his 40 year ago salary, not his current salary. And what about Michelle Obama? No, Michael Jordan. Jordan's yearly income from the endorsements is his endorsements is estimated to be around $40 million. Jordan set records in player salary by signing annual contracts worth in excess of $30 million per season. In June 2010, George was ranked by Forbes as the 20th most powerful celebrity in the world, with 55 million earned between June 2009 and June 2010. According to the Forbes article, Jordan Brands generated one billion in sales per night. No, no, these are kind of like mind-boggling figures. It's like, oh, this is nauseating, you know? Michelle Obama. Born in uh, January 17, 1964. She's an American lawyer, writer, is a wife of the 44th and current president of the United States, Barack Obama. First African American First Lady of the United States. Uh, attended Princeton University and Harvard Law School. Worked at the law firm Sidney Austin, where she met her future husband. Their net worth in 2006, by their income tax, was about $273,000, which, you know, they're, they're ranking a little low here compared to some of the other people. Um, and it goes along with other figures. But if any of these men and women are not serving Christ, what does the Bible say about them if they're not serving Christ? What does the Bible say? Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone if they gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in His Father's glory with the angels, and then He will reward each person according to what they have done. Uh-oh. Salvation by works. Is that what it means? What does it mean we, what does what we do have to do with it? Isn't that salvation by works? 
Or, you know, why should we work? Why should we work? Do we need to work? Does work have anything to do with our salvation? Anybody? We work because we are saved, not to be saved, because of our appreciation for what our Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. He laid down his life. He gave us eternity. I mean, he just he's given us so much. If we say we love Jesus, then we should obey his commands, which he says are not burdensome. I think the biggest reason we go to work is that no one ever told us that God, the biggest reason we don't go to work is that no one ever told us that God expected us to. And we were never really taught how. Now I would wager that every one of us in this church and other Adventist churches desperately wants to go to work. We just need to know how. Now how does Christian success compare to worldly success? If you look at Acts 17, 6, and when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men have turned the world upside down and have come here also. And Jason has received them. And they're all acting against the decree of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. The children, the Christian definition of success turns the world definition upside down. Our king is not Caesar. It's not the people on the dollar bill. But King Jesus. We do not worship man, mammon or money or material things, but God. Our honor is to serve, not to be served. Our wealth is in heaven, not on earth. We don't deposit our heavenly treasures in a bank safe deposit box. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 19, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves don't break in and steal. But does Jesus mean, what does Jesus mean when he uses the word treasures? When Jesus says treasures, what comes to your mind when you hear treasures? Anyway. Uh, yeah. Smart guys always have the answer here. <laughs> Listen to this. Christian entreats, lay up, Christ entreats, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. This work of transferring your possessions to the world above is worthy of all your best energies. It is of the highest importance and involves your eternal interest. That which you bestow in the cause of God is not lost. All that is given for the salvation of souls and the glory of God is invested in the most successful enterprise in this life and in the life to come. Your talents of gold and silver are given to the exchangers are gained continually in value, which will be registered to your account in the kingdom of heaven. You are to be the recipients of the eternal wealth that is increased in the hands of the exchangers. In giving to the work of God, you are laying up for yourselves treasures in heaven. All that you may that you lay up above is secure from disaster and loss and is increasing to eternal and enduring substances. Now I made up a survey just to, to give to for church members just to, to help people uh, think more about church work. And I'm going to share the survey with you and you guys feel free to answer. You don't have to answer, but you can answer if you want to. Uh, the first question on it is. What is the mission of the church? What's the mission of the church? You know, and I had to, when I first heard this, I thought, what is the mission of the church? Uh, I mean, we can say so many things about the mission of the church. Anybody got an instant answer? Introduce people to Jesus. Introduce people to Jesus. That's a good one. And, and that may actually be it. What I have here is, what, what, what? hang on, let me read you something from Marvin Moore. Page 209 in the book, The End Time. He said, it is absolutely essential that we have a correct understanding of who we are as the remnant. People may chide us for supporting that we, a tiny minority in comparison to the size of the world population or even Christendom as a whole, have been uniquely called by God to prepare the rest of the world for his coming. That's like saying God didn't call Noah 
because out of the entire world population at that time, only eight souls made it up, it's made up as true people. But we must understand that God has indeed raised up the Seventh-day Adventist church, like he did Noah, to proclaim the imminent end of the world. The only reason we exist as a remnant is to proclaim God's end-time message. A recognition and acceptance of this responsibility is a primary challenge facing the Seventh-day Adventist Church today, especially in North America and, our developing part, and other developing parts of the world. I don't mean that massive numbers of our people have given up their faith, that God led them. The problem isn't mass apostasy, it's mass indifference. I recognize this dwelling sense of mission in the declining numbers of the churches in North America that still include the weekly mission story as a part of their Sabbath school. I'm sorry, that still that still include the weekly mission story as a part of their Sabbath school program. I see it in the fewer and fewer numbers of pastors are willing to include a personal ministries period uh, somewhere in the Sabbath morning services. I agree with those pastors who say that we come to church to worship God, but since we did, our worship of God became separate, separated from our witness for God. I see the loss of our sense of mission in the declining subscription rates of all Seventh-day Adventist publications since about 1975. I am particularly aware of this as the editor of Science of the Time. Can you understand how Vitally important it is that we have not only a correct understanding of ourselves as a remnant, but that we have an urgency about the message God has called us to proclaim. Of all the ways to think about the end time, this is the most crucial. For if we fail to understand who we are and have a sense of urgency about the work of God, the work that God has given us to do, then none of the other things I've said in this book matter. That's why I urge you to do everything you can to share our end time message with as many people as possible. Okay, that was question number one. What is the work of the church? Now, actually, I would say the work of the church is what you said. And the mission is to carry this message to the whole world. And you say, well, we have Red Adventist churches everywhere, but everybody in the world has not been reached yet. There are places where still no one in, in large parts of, our, of the earth don't even know the name of Jesus yet. Uh, what is the work of the church? Matthew 28, 19 through 20. We won't read that again because you've been, you know, bad for that one. But go and make disciples of all nations, you know, baptizing them in the name of Jesus. And why did Jesus come to the earth? Matthew 18, 11. Why did Jesus come to the earth? You guys probably know that by memory. Matthew 18, 11, he says... For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. That's why I came. And why did you become a Christian? Ah, why did you become a Christian? Oscar, why did you become a Christian? <laughs> he looks towards his head like this. You're on, you're on the spot now. Why did you become a Christian? Because uh, God shows me love. Ah, because God showed you love. Wow. I can't think of a better reason to come to Christ than because He showed us love. Right there. Um, how many others in this city would love to have what you now have promised to you? How many people in this city do you think would love to have what you just said, Oscar? Would love to feel everybody. it. Everybody. Even the ones who don't know it. Everybody would love to have it, I would say. Um, well. How, uh, what is what is keeping me, what is keeping us, what is keeping you individually from personally fishing for men on a regular basis? Now don't answer this question out loud, but just think it to yourself. What is keeping you from, from actually fishing for men on a regular basis? Anything? Identify what that thing is and then attack it. Ask God to help you deal with that one thing that's keeping you from going out. And fishing from here. Um, you can ask, I, I could ask the question how many people have, have ever been taught how to make disciples? Or have you ever been in or led a personal one on one Bible study? How many people that you personally reached out to have been baptized? How did Jesus teach our disciples to make disciples? Um, 
Is personal evangelism a talent or a privilege? Ah, that's a question. Is personal evangelism a talent or a privilege? Both. Both. Who said, who said? Privilege. Okay. Got something to read to you. I can find it. Um, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Matthew 6, 15. Is Christ's command to his followers. Not that all are called to be ministers or missionaries in the ordinary sense of the term, but all may be workers with him in giving the glad tidings to their fellow men. To all, great, small, learned, or ignorant, old or young, the command is given. Go, go, go. And I'm just, I'm saying all this just to encourage you, because in a minute, actually in this minute, um, I have a lot to commend this church on. Because I think this church is doing things that I haven't seen many. We've been, Gloria and I have been going around Sabbath, Sabbath after Sabbath to different, we've been visiting different churches. And um, we've seen lots of things going on in lots of different churches and commendable things. Like in the Raleigh Church, um, after the Devon the Franklin service, there was, he did an altar call something. And people came and lined up. There were probably 30 people up front after he called people who wanted to commit themselves to Christ. So what I saw the elders do there, they went up to each person and got the telephone numbers and got the contact information and said, hey, how can we get in contact with you? Can we continue this conversation? That was cool. We went down to um, Scotty, Scotty, Scotty Deal's church in, in Pembroke. And Scotty, after church was over, he took Gloria and I, uh, us around, Gloria and I around and showed us what they been doing. They have a big, huge room in the back with, with clothes that were donated, and they have a, a clothes donation day where they call anybody from the community to come and they donate clothes to them. And when we were there, most of the, the real members, the actual members of the church were gone. There were 25 new people there that were not members of the church. In this church, um, Steve has spearheaded this first Sunday thing. And this, you've done it, what, two? Two, yeah, two months in a row now. Steve, would you like to tell us a little bit about what's going on there? Here, there. Hey, here, can you come up here? Good time. It's lonely up here. Have you seen Good morning. Um, yeah, and I want to first of all thank Joe uh, Figueredo because ultimately the idea stemmed from his brain, his uh, prayer study, and that, you know, went ahead and pressed upon his heart that we need to be out there, we need to be passing out some literature. Okay. You know? So he came to me like, hey, can we do this together? And, you know, we thought about maybe one of the, um, the uh, pop as I'm thinking straight here, one of the uh, parking lots for, you know, the, the food stores in the town. And so we started praying about it and we found out about the first Sunday in Pittsburgh where they have a little, they call it an artesian fair. So we thought it would be nice if we could go ahead and get a booth set up, but we found out you're not allowed at the event unless you're actually selling something. And the only thing we wanted to do was to go ahead and pass out literature. So when we told them that, uh, we found out uh, through Brother Rob uh, Nunley, uh, he said, hey, we know somebody that can help out and uh, sell some baked goods. So we thought this was awesome. So we went ahead and made the application the whole nine yards. But the person, unfortunately, that was doing the baked goods fell ill, and they had backed out. But being we were that far along the line, they said, you know what, you guys can come here, the, you know, that this was November, uh, October. They said, yeah, you can come here, you can set up your little booth, and, you know, even though you won't have anything to sell this time, you can just, you know, finish, follow through, and pass out your literature. And in the course of four hours, we had 19 individuals we had more than that that took literature, but we had 19 individuals that either requested prayer study, requested prayer, gave us contact information. So we really felt blessed. And I really want to thank um, Iomi because, uh, praise God, Brother Dave Clement did an awesome job helping Joe and I set up and get started. But it really wasn't until the woman's touch came around <laughs> that our booth became approachable. So I really encourage if you have, if you really, the women of, of the congregation, like I say, if it's upon your heart, please come out one time um, to help us out. This last time, uh, well, I anyway, the, the long story short is we thought that potentially was going to be it. We prayed about it, and we asked them, could we come back the following month, even though we wouldn't have anything to sell 
like we thought, but then we started getting some great ideas from Kathy McCadden and from Annette and, and some different people as far as little items that we can try to sell at the table. And they said, yeah, you can come on out, you know, and, and, and after talking to him, he's like, you're good to go from here on out. So we've, we've got a booth and we're, we're going to be able to go on out there in December and praise God they'll be closed in uh, January and February, but my hope is that we can start it back up in March and, and get the word out that we're here. You know, we really are here. This, this, this somewhere along the lines, this has made an awesome uh, difference in each one of our lives. And I know if you're like me, you've had to walk during the week, the month, the year, where, you know, sometimes it feels a little more special, other times it's like, Lord, give me strength. But we have found something awesome. God did reveal something awesome to us. And if we try to remember that first love and get out there and just be energized again and share it with other people, let God do the work. Let the Holy Spirit do the work. But just tell people about what difference it made in your life. And there's nobody in the world that can argue with that. And once they see and hear your little testimony or story, people will be attracted to it. Some of them won't. But the bottom line is, is you've planted a seed. And that's all we're asking to do. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to just read off uh, the names of the individuals that came by this last time. So we can pray for them? Well, we pray for them. I really, like I said, I, I'm, I'm apologize because I'd like to get a list out so to help you guys remember them during the week. But we did have a bunch of people that came by this time as well, too, that had asked for prayer, um, a bunch that had asked for Bible studies. So I just want to go ahead uh, and just read off the people's names. Hopefully, um, we can say a little prayer, and if you wouldn't mind, if you would pray and uh, go from there, but there's a Lawrence uh, Garcia, and um, he's been asked for prayer because he just opened up a business, so we know what kind of stress he's under. Um, there's a Norman Street uh, that just entered hospice, and they've asked for prayer for him. Um, a Malcolm Ray, and I apologize, they did not write down but uh, the specifics, but uh, they asked for prayer for Malcolm Ray, a Susan Hilliard, um, Annette was taking blood pressure, and her blood pressure was elevated, so we want to pray for Susan. Uh, Phil Diamond, who I mentioned to, um, to Ron, he's requesting Bible studies, and hopefully maybe he can make it over to uh, your Bible study that you have on Tuesday nights. Um, Noble uh, is a young gentleman, 16 years old, and boy, praise God for uh, Tony's wife, Denise. I mean, she started engaging him in conversation. He was there in 20, 25 minutes asking questions and, you know, fired up for a Bible study. Um, another young woman uh, by the name of Sunshine O'Neill, uh, same thing. And then also a, a woman by the name of Kay Ray, uh, and she asked for a Bible study as well. So um, we might not think there's people out there that want to hear the message. We might get into the humdrums of, you know, not wanting to talk with it. But, you know, just like, um, I apologize, I want to say it was Elijah. When he felt alone, and God said, "Hey, we got seven thousand, you know, people out there you don't even know about." So just because you might look at your situation at work, you might look at people in the grocery store with the frowns on their faces. Pray for whoever you see, whoever you come in contact with. Let the Lord impress you, impress them, and God will. Only we can go ahead and together, you know, have a few more smiling faces around. Do you have how many people? Eight. Eight, eight this time. So. But, um, but yeah, I, when I, at, the, at the end, I apologize. I apologize. no, it's not, at the end, I'll actually, I'll actually pray. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. One, one of the names that you read is uh, Relative Operation. Are you serious? Yeah, Norman Stroud, the one with the connection is that, that someone in Pittsburgh knew them and asked them to be prayed for. Did you did you uh, even know know about that ahead of time? No. Yeah. 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 Which, the which one is it? Norman Stroud. Okay, I apologize for now. That's awesome. God. That's incredible. You see how God works? <laughs> Amen. Amen. And uh, we have a new member of our church, which you guys know, and, and I, I also, uh, Melinda. And Melinda, if you could just briefly tell us, how did you come to, to be a member of this church? Well, I have been praying for God to tell me what to do because I had studied with Jehovah's Witnesses and I had gone away from God for a while. I had wanted to get back into it. So I had been praying for him to, for me, for whether I should go back studying with the witnesses or what I should do. And a couple days later, he sent somebody from the uh, uh, Clayton Church to my house. Because I had said, I had picked up uh, 
a brochure from one of the books. And they asked me, did I want, was I interested in having a Bible study? And that's when they sent Lynn and Bob and I. Wow. And you're now a member of our church? Yes. How long ago was that? Two or three months ago? No, so that's been back in, uh, I would say, April, May. Okay, great. Great. Um, how's Carthage doing? Anybody? Phyllis? Uh, we're doing great. We're really uh, excited right now. We have been studying on evangelism. Rob has had a good week of studying on evangelism. And someone that's in our neighborhood came to one of the studies, and we don't do that. But we're especially crying, right, with that the Baptist preacher at the church we used to go to, but he wasn't a preacher when we went there, yeah. has been coming to some of our Bible studies. And that some of us went to his house last night, him and his wife's house. He's still coming? He's still When he can, he comes. And he actually came in when we were talking about the three angels message, almost had a stroke. But, <laughs> <laughs> but they, his, his grandmother was at this, but anyway. That and other people were trying to well, We have a lot of prayer for it. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And in Pittsburgh, we have a Bible study group that um, meets in the Greek Cusina on Tuesday nights at 7 o'clock. And we started out humbly, and then a few more members came. And then one day, we, I had, had posted a, uh, a flyer in the restaurant, a few flyers around town. We came in for our Bible study. It was just us. There were no visitors. And we saw this woman who was sitting at a table, but you know, she was just sitting there in the restaurant. We went around to start a Bible study. And when we got up, she came around the corner and said, are you guys the Bible study? I said, yeah. She said, are you the ones on that sign out front? I said, yeah, we're the ones. Can I join your Bible study group? Yes, you can. <laughs> and uh, she's been with us for several months now. And then two weeks ago, uh, we well, for the last couple of weeks, we've been uh, Outreaching and talking with one of the, one of the, the women that is actually a, a hostess or a waiter or whatever you want to call it there. And the last time I talked to her two weeks ago, I said, you know, anytime you want to sit down and, and study with us or join our group, you're welcome. And so she said, okay, thank you. We came back the next Tuesday. The owner of the restaurant said, I won't say that, but said she just went home to change clothes and she's going to come back and join the Bible study group. I'm like, ah, oh, surprise, you know. And this guy's Muslim, you know, which is incredible because he's been, he supported us, he's facilitated us being there. It's incredible how, you know, he's taken us to the mosque, took our whole Bible study group to the mosque, met with the imam, we sat down and talked with the imam, and fielded, he fielded a bunch of questions from us. And then the last time we were in, he asked me, he said, you know, what kind of what faith do you guys? Can you tell me a little bit about you? And I was like, okay. Oh, hey. <laughs> yeah. So I have a, a plan for, for, for uh, helping him understand a little bit better about it. So things are going on in this church. Amen, praise God. Amen. So don't think I'm beating up on you guys. You guys are doing it. We just need to do it more. That's all. We just need to do it more. So what is this idea? What is the formula for success? The formula is simple. It's all about, what do you think? The formula for success, the formula for Christian success is all about one word. Faith. Faith, yeah. Commitment, yeah. Obey. Obey, yeah. There you go. You got the word that I was looking for. All of those are good things, but it's about relationships. That's what it's about all about. In the world, their success is determined by their relationship with what? Money. Money. There. I mean, how many successful people, famous successful people do you know that are work? That are on the street? I didn't know one guy who became famous. He was a street guy. He used to be a broadcaster, and they discovered him on the street again. I guess you guys have seen that YouTube video. And now he's famous again. But usually, fame and success don't go along with being broke. you got to have some money to be successful in the, in, in the world. Um, they have lots of relationships. You can have lots of relationships with people in the world, but if you're broke, rarely are you recognized as successful. In the kingdom of God, success equals. I'm looking at the In the kingdom of God, success equals what? Hmm? Eternal life. But how about souls? Success equals souls. People want the Christ. Having a right relationship with those in the world. 
This is Jesus' treasure, and this will be ours. Now, Jesus said in Revelation 3.20, He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will enter to him, and I will dine with him, and he with me. The first step in the success, in kingdom success, is letting Jesus in. Everybody who's going to have kingdom success has to first hear that knock, open that door, and let Jesus in. Jesus said, and one of, well, it, it says, and one of them, a lawyer, questioned him, testing him, and saying, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as, you, as yourself. And on these two commandments, all the law and the prophets hang. So, can you see the relationships? There's our relationship with God. There's our relationship with the body of Christ. And then there's the body of Christ's relationship with the rest of the world. Relationship, relationship, relationship. And if you, well, Oscar said that when he was teaching. He said the sanctuary is the plan of, is a basically a condensed version, a visual aid for the plan of salvation. Well, if you look at Acts 2, turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Wait. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And actually, we're going to go from Acts 2, 1 to 47. We're not going to read it all, and we're not going to discuss everything in it. I'm going to go through this as quickly as I can. Um, but just like the, the, the plan of salvation is, is condensed into the sanctuary, you can find the entire Christian success plan here in, the chat, in Acts 2. The chat, and from, from verse 1 to verse 47 in, chapter, in Acts, Acts 2. Um, already... These people, the disciples who were assembled for Pentecost, had already heard the knock of Jesus on their door. They had already answered it before Acts 2. Uh, they, were, they had already been walking with Jesus. If you look in verse 3 and 4, what happened to them there in 3 and 4? It says, And there appeared unto them flowing tongues like a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What happens here? What did they receive? Yeah, they received power. And what was that power for? There you go. Spread God's Word. Um, and this is, the, this is relationship with God. Look at 14. What did, what did Peter do here? So the Peter standing up with the leaven lifted up his voice and said to them, You men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. Peter preached the first sermon in the Christian church after Jesus had gone back to heaven. This is relationship with God and with man. Look in verse 38, 41. 38, then Peter said to them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And 41 says, Then they all gladly received his word, were baptized in the same day. There were added unto them about how many? 3,000 souls. 3,000 souls that day. So, relationship with our neighbors. 42. What's going on in verse 42? And they continue steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. This is part of what, no, this is before the hospital read. They have relationship with God again. This is one of the essentials of the Christian success formula. To have daily devotion time prayer and study. And I think this is one of the areas that I'm discovering that probably many Christians, but I can only focus on my church, but I'm, I'm beginning to realize a lot of us are kind of weak in that area of devotional time, having a daily Bible study, having daily time with God. If we don't have that time with God, reading His Word and on our knees praying, can we have power? 
Can we be powerful without the Word of God here, without the Holy Spirit reigning in our body and guiding us through our day and giving us power? Can we have power? We can't. We can't have power. If we look at 43 through 46, here we see relationship with the body. It says, And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. So we see power here. And all that believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house to eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Is that not the perfect picture of a Christian church where we're all together, we are like mind, there's no fighting, there's no jealousy, there's no envy in the church, and we are about one thing. We have one common goal, and that is to win the world for Christ. Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. The book of Acts is beginning is the beginning of the story that we are now ending. I remember Sister White saying that if you look at the end of the book of Acts, how does it end? Does anybody just, can you think of how the book of Acts ends? It doesn't, really. It just kind of dot, 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 to be continued. Because the book of Acts continues on up until today. We are the end of the book of Acts. We are the final chapter of that book. And it's what we do today that will determine how that story... Now, we know the end of the story. The, story. the end of the story is already written. But what part do we want to play in the end of that story? World success, world, the world success formula is what? Money, fame, fortune, material things. And if there's no Jesus involved in that, yeah. God's success formula is sacrifice, commitment to Him. All the things we talked about today, yes, well, most of us will die, but what will the end be for us? Eternal life and glory with Jesus for eternity. All we have to do is follow Him. And I was imagining this morning, I was saying, God, you know, I just want to follow Jesus. I was imagining seeing footprints and me stepping in every one of his footprints, not stepping anywhere to the left or to the right, but just stepping in his footprints, following Jesus, through sacrifice, through pain, through whatever God needs me in. He has a path for you. He has a path for you. He has a path for you, 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 you. Now, we will all be working, walking parallel to each other. You won't be going way out that way and this way and one going that way. We'll be parallel, but our path will be a little bit different because he has a different job for each one of us. But just remember this one thing. Every true disciple born into the kingdom of God is born a missionary. Every true disciple, true disciple born into the kingdom of God is born a missionary. That's our work. That's all he asks us to do is go and mend souls for him.